Hello everyone, my name is Vic and I am a sophomore student from Cần Thơ University of Medicine and Pharmacy, course 44, class YJ. Today my topic is the um, clinical anatomy of the circle of Willis. Let's get to it. First, I will recall the anatomy of arterial supply to the brain. The arterial supply to the brain is derived from the pair internal carotid and pair vertebral artery. First, we review the internal carotid artery. As you can see here, this is the common carotid artery and this is the subclavian artery. They are a little bit different between them on the right, left and right side. On the left side, they derive directly from the aortic arch, but from the right side, they derive from the brachiocephalic trunk artery, or we can call the innominate artery, which is one of three large branches of aortic arch, accompanied with the left common carotid and the left subclavian artery. This is the lateral view from the right side, because we can see a part of the brachiocephalic trunk here. This is the right common carotid and this is the right subclavian artery. The internal carotid arteries arise from the bifurcation of the common carotid artery at about the level of the superior border of the thyroid cartilage corresponding to the C4 vertebra. They are described as the direct continuation of the common carotid with no branches in the neck and they ascend to the base of the skull um, where they enter the carotid canal. Next, they pass anteriorly and medially through the cavernous sinus. The purple one and the blue one. Uh, to enter the cranial cavity and divide into its terminal branches. These branches are <clears throat> the anterior cerebral artery, the middle cerebral artery, the biggest one, the posterior communicating artery, the anterior choroidal artery is in the lateral ventricle, and the ophthalmic artery, which supplies the eye. This is the lateral section we will have a better view in a transverse section through the circle of Willis. Second, the vertebral arteries. They are the first branches of the subclavian arteries in the root of the neck. They are sent through the transverse foramina of vertebra C6 to C1. Enter, they enter the cranial cavity through the fora to through the foramen magnum and unite to form the basilar artery near the junction of the pons and medullas. The chief intracranial branches of the vertebral arteries are the posterior inferior cerebellar artery. At the superior border of the pons, the basilar artery divides into the posterior cerebral artery before its terminal bifurcation the chief branches of the basilar artery are the anterior inferior cerebellar artery this one the anterior inferior cerebellar artery the superior cerebellar artery and several pontine arteries moving on the circle of Willis. The two anterior cerebral arteries join through the anterior communicating branch. The posterior communicating branch joins the middle cerebral with the posterior cerebral artery. The circle of Willis is the major anastomosis of the cerebral vasculature. That circle includes three main pair of arteries. The anterior cerebral artery, the posterior communicating artery and the posterior cerebral artery. The middle cerebral artery just contributes a small part. This allows for perfusion of the brain even with arterial occlusion of one or more major arteries, such as carotid insufficiency. 
If the occlusion develops slowly, the anastomosis vessel will expand to compensate. However, the anastomosis may not be able to compensate if the occlusion develops rapidly, as with trauma. Blockage of one cerebral artery will have characteristic effects based on the region of the brain supplied by the vessel. The anterior cerebral artery supplies the median surface of the cerebrum. The middle cerebral artery supplies the lateral surface, and the posterior cerebral artery supplies the inferior surface. The middle cerebral artery is occluded most often, presumably because it follows the same trajectory as the internal carotid. So we get to the main part, the clinical anatomy. And today we learn about the Berry aneurysm. So what is, a, what is an aneurysm in general? An aneurysm is a localized widening or dilation of an artery, a vein or the heart. At the point of an aneurysm, there is typically a bunch. The wall of the blood vessel of or organ is weakened and may rupture. So, what is an a berry aneurysm? This one is also called a saccular aneurysm. This is one of the most common type of brain aneurysm. They make up 90% of all brain aneurysms, according to Stanford Healthcare. Berry aneurysm tend to appear at the base of the brain where the major blood vessel meet, we can call it junction, also known as the circle of Gullers. So this is the classification of aneurysm. We base on the shape, so we have a saccular and a fusiform, saccular and fusiform. If we base on a true or false aneurysm, so we have a real aneurysm and a pseudo aneurysm. A real aneurysm involves all three layers, the intima, the media, and the ventitia. But the pseudo aneurysm just involves one or two layers, the media or the ventitia, a ventitia or both of them. Pseudo aneurysm, due to defect in vessel wall, uh, defect of the intima, or defect of the, both intima and media. It will form an extravascular hematoma that communicates with intravascular space. So we move to the most important part. We learn barrier aneurysm with ABC method. So what is ABC? A is the etiology, B is pathogenesis. In other disease we use pathogen but in barrier aneurysm we use pathogenesis and C is pathophysiology. So etiology, there are several etiology like degenerative disease, atherosclerosis, arteriosclerosis, structural weakness or defect of the intima, the media or the adventitia, congenital conditions like McFon syndrome, decoctation of the aorta, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, polycystic kidney disease, or inflammatory condition like Takayasu's disease or Basset disease. About the pathogenesis, at the junction, the vessel normally lacks of an internal elastic membrane and smooth muscle. About the pathophysiology, saccular aneurysm developed from defects in the muscular middle layer, we can call it the media of arteries. The vessel walls are less res resistant to the changes in intraluminal pressure. At sites of vessel bifurcation or junction, the blood flow is most turbulent and shear forces against the arterial wall are the greatest. About the symptoms, uh, a quickly bad headache or we can call a thunderclap. We have unconsciousness, uncontrolled urination and defecation, nausea and vomiting, neck rigidity, rigidity here is the same with um, stiff neck, it is caused by the irritation of the meninges, patient will have pain above or behind the eye or large pupils. About diagnosis, we can use CT scan with contrast uh, or we can call CT angiography like this, like this picture. If we don't use contrast, we can't see the aneurysm. 
um, we can use a an MR, a MRI 1.5 Tesla and, a, and 1.5 Tesla is enough we don't need to use MRI 3 Tesla for coronary artery disease and we can use an angiogram about the cerebrovascular accidents, it is a like a general terminology. The CVA is caused by 80% by the obstruction by the blood clots by the LDL plaques, it is the lipo low density lipoprotein or arterial vasospasm. And the last 20% is caused by aneurysms or AVM. AVM is arterial venous malformation. The best treatment for this is clip ligation. It is performed, usually performed by a neurosurgeon. And other treatment are endovascular coiling, usually done by an interventional neuroradiologist. We can use medication like calcium channel blockers. It is very useful for preventing coexisting arterial vasospasm. This is the clip ligation, and this is the endovascular coiling. And this is my references and thank you for your listening.